Welcome to episode 41 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Race Relations Unproductive Dialogue, where I'll discuss a few thoughts on some claims and comments that you might see people make during discussions on race. This episode will be a bit shorter and is kind of a bonus episode as my co-host Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary was unable to join me to discuss the previous episode, Improving Race Relations. In that episode, I offered some thoughts applicable to anyone engaging in the topic of race. You know, Coca-Cola was recently in the news over various slides leaked from a corporate training session. A slide encouraging people to be less white seemed to be get the most attention, spurring quite a few memes and some jokes. It also generated a bit of con uh, conversation, or should I say, debate. And that debate gave me the idea for this episode. That said, let's dive right in. Hey everyone, welcome back. I wanted to start by recapping the last four episodes in my series on race relations. If you watched one or more of them, you have my full appreciation. If you haven't, I encourage you to check them out, all of them. I hope to have provided some valuable insight on the topic of race and what divides us. If you will, indulge me for a quick recap here. In episode 34, Hearing the Voice of the Unheard, I walk through a portion of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s the Other America speech. The purpose of that episode was not to tell you what you should have gotten from the speech, but rather to listen and then present what I heard. Wherever there is successful communication, listening is always involved. During that episode, I also dig into some history where Dr. King references events that I wasn't quite as familiar with since he gave the speech in 1967. Then in episode 36, The Experience of Being Experienced, I draw insight from two books, Social Intelligence by Daniel Goleman and Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. There, I kind of sidestep the All Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter debate to talk about how everyone wants to be experienced during conversation and how the debate currently fails to achieve that. Then next in episode 38, Book Review, White Fragility, I offer a commentary on Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, and why the book, in my opinion, and the idea is overly complex, disingenuous, and contributes to the cult of ignorance. And then finally, in episode 40, Improving Race Relations, I give five easy steps that anyone can take to improve race relations. These five items are ask the right question, define boundaries, remain approachable, be open, and expect likewise from others. Now, if you prefer a more discussion style podcast, check out episodes 35, 37, and 39, where my co-host and I have a discussion on the very same topics. In this bonus episode, I want to cover just a few comments that we frequently see that interfere with any productive discussion on race. I only cover a few because the goal is for you to see them conceptually and then apply them to others that you come across, maybe even use. With that, let's start with a quote that I saw posted on Facebook recently. Here's how it goes. I've heard many white folks say, where I grew up, we treated everyone equal. We had no concept of race. It's time you had an honest conversation with the black people you grew up with to find out how much of your bliss came at the expense of their silence and forced smiles. This comment comes from a person of color. And that comment got a number of people immediately upset. The two biggest issues seem to be that uh, the comment was generalizing about white people and that it assumed to know the experiences that white people have had with black people. I don't have any issue with the comment personally. The idea that we, quote, had no concept of race, end quote, bears a deep meaning to many white people. And likewise, the comment silence and forced smiles also has deep meaning to black people. It's time that both sides learn exactly what that meaning is. The best way to achieve that is if both sides come to the table ready to listen. 
all that's being said here, in my opinion, is that you might want to consider what you think you know about how black people think of your experiences with them. Not a big deal. The statement generalizes a little bit by assuming that white people who say they grew up treating people equal haven't had honest conversations on race with black people. But generalizing is really hardly unique to anyone during conversations. Sometimes generalizing materializes negatively, other times more neutral. But if we're going to have a productive conversation on sensitive matters such as race, it's best that we learn to tolerate generalizing just a little bit better. And by, by insisting that others do what we, uh, in, by insisting that others do, we do two things. We hold them to an, a standard that we are unlikely to maintain ourselves. We also distract ourselves from learning more about that person's experiences and what leads them to believe what they believe. And besides, it's very possible that you and those around you really did work to treat everyone equally. Whether other members felt they were treated equally is another matter. Consider this relatable example. Many spouses will tell their significant other they don't feel hurt. We tend to nod our heads when a woman says that of her husband, right? Mm-hmm. Men. But it happens in the reverse as well, also with same-sex couples and even friendships. Often, the person complaining has a different perspective of what it means to be heard than the person who is accused of doing it. For instance, my experience growing up was kind of like elbowing your way into the conversation. My wife, not so much. When I take over the conversation from my perspective, I'm just talking. From hers, though, I'm not stopping long enough to give her an opportunity to speak, or worse, I'm interrupting. You might think of it as her understanding the rules of engagement for a dialogue differ from mine. And since mine give me more speaking time, she feels excluded. Now apply that to the comment I just quoted. This person of color may be understood as uh, black people and white people have a different understanding of what it means to treat everyone equally. And that white people who say they always did are quite possibly unaware if the black people around them felt the same way. This doesn't mean that you did not treat people fairly. Maybe you did. Maybe you did not. You must first deal with the perception before you can worry about the reality. How about this comment? I'm not racist. I have black friends. I'm not sure there is any defense that people use when accused of racism that's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that there's any defense that people use when accused of racism more than this one. And you know what? I'm not really sure that there is one any less useful either. I have thoughts on this statement regarding those who say it and regarding those who criticize or mock others for saying it. So first, if this is something that you say, stop. It's not a defense. You might think it is, and it says nothing about any accusation that's leveled against you. The reason it isn't a meaningful defense is because the friendship with black people or any person of color is not the criteria for determining if you are a racist or not. And it's certainly possible to hold negative views about a group of people while befriending a few that for whatever reason qualify as different from the rest. Or holding negative views about one race while giving another race a pass. In fact, I'll bet that many people who have tried to use this defense have also said that some person of color was racist for something they said or did, even though that same person of color had a few white friends. In other words, people are too inconsistent for this to be used as such a guarantee. And if you're accused of racism, it's unlikely the accusation of racism is based on the friendships that you have or don't have. It's based on some other reason. And that is the reason that you should be addressing. I've also seen where people mock others for using this defense, even claim that using it is evidence of their racism. If that's you, stop. It's not the condemnation you think it is. When people say this, in many cases, they're doing two things. 
One, they're trying to defend themselves against a charge or association with racism. And then two, they're communicating their experience. When someone defends themselves of racism, it's because they don't approve of racism and they don't want to be known as a racist. They're on the same page as you that racism is a bad thing. They may differ on what it means to be racist or what racism is, but nonetheless, they are opposed to racism and that is a good thing. It's also a good starting point. Second, and I'm kind of speaking for people here based on observations over time. When people tell you about their black friend, the black child they adopt or have adopted, their spouse or whomever, I believe they are communicating the message that they have a personal connection to people of color and that so far as they understand through that connection, they have a meaningful relation, the relationship not driven by race. This is also a good thing. We want people to have meaningful relationships with those of other races. Though this is a good thing, it doesn't mean that people are exempt from bad behaviors. It doesn't mean that people are exempt from being oblivious to the experience and feelings of others. It doesn't even mean that people won't act in contradiction. You know, a moment ago I said the idea that we had no concept of race bears a deep meaning to many white people. And then I said the same goes for silence and forced smiles, that it has deep meaning for black people. It's time for both sides to learn exactly what that is. The best way to achieve it is if both sides come to the table ready to listen. I should value learning from your experience no less than you value from learning from mine. And, if we, and we both lose if one of us disregards the other's experience because it was communicated poorly or as a defense when it should not have been. Are you seeing a trend here? If you've watched my other episodes, it should be clear. The problem, as I argue, is that our racial divide today stems from a communication problem, not a racial problem. It's a tough pill to swallow. And if you're not convinced, I'm going to spend some time thinking about the behaviors and attitudes of those from a different race that you have a problem with. What I want you to do is really ask yourself this question. Can I find these behaviors and attitudes in people of some other group, any group? For instance, Robin DiAngelo, who coined the term white fragility, defines it as being, quote, the defensiveness, the argumentation, the hurt feelings, the withdrawal that often erupts whenever white people are challenged on their racial worldviews, end quote. Think about that for a moment. It's true. Many white people do respond in those ways when challenged on their racial worldviews. But it's also true that black people also respond in those ways when challenged on racial worldviews. And it's also true that men respond in those ways when challenged on their views about the sexes, as do women. And heterosexual people respond in those ways when challenged on their views about sexuality, as do those of other sexual groups. And here's where it gets interesting. Whites may respond in those ways when challenged on their views about the sexes or sexuality, and likewise with, black, with blacks. And men respond in those ways when challenged on sexuality or race as again, do women. These same responses are not limited to any particular group and are not limited to matters that specifically define that particular group. And yes, I am generalizing a bit because not all members of any group respond in any particular way to any given challenge of a particular worldview. I want to discuss a couple more briefly here. Have you ever heard someone say, I don't see color? Of course you have. And you know what? If that's you, stop. You see color. If you didn't, you would, you would be genuinely surprised to find out what color someone was. Now, maybe you mean, I don't let color influence me. Well, then say what you mean. But be careful. It may not be any better. Maybe you've been told you were, or you used the term yourself, white-splaining. 
You're probably familiar with the term, but if not, it's used to describe a white person who is explaining a concept or an idea to a person of color where it's assumed that the person of color is unfamiliar. It's also used when a white person talks over or for a person of color, effectively hijacking their time to speak. White splaining describes an actual phenomenon in the narrow context of race. So why should we stop using the term if it's kind of legit? Well, because it doesn't get to the heart of the behavior. If a white person is white splaining to a person of color, say telling them that uh, what their racism really is, chances are they are engaging in that same behavior elsewhere to others on different topics. When communicating, the goal should be to communicate clearly and directly. Saying you don't see color or accusing people of some sort of splaining is neither clear nor direct. It requires the person to translate the word or the phrase that you're using and then hope that they end up with the same understanding as you have. Apply this now, the same reasoning, to other terms and phrases you use, even those on other topics. It's not that these responses have no bearing. It's that the way we communicate often gets in the way of a productive conversation. You know, everyone has likely heard these words too. You people. And then somebody that says it goes on to make some sort of generalization about who they are talking to. The response is often, what do you mean, you people? And for good reason. It's not a term that has a universally understood meaning. Moreover, it has a negative connotation. And it, its use distracts from the point that the speaker is trying to make. When we are not clear and direct, when we speak with ambiguous terms or even absolutes, we often distract the listener from the point that we are trying to make. And then when the listener doesn't receive the message or doesn't receive it well, we have a tendency to ignore our own role in having that happen. If someone responds poorly to something that you've said, if what you had to say was important enough, then it should be important enough for you to find out why. If not, then maybe you should question why you bothered saying anything at all. Think of the various comments or responses to people you've heard or said yourself and how what I've described in this episode applies. Remember, the goal is to learn as much about the other person as possible. I'm not an expert communicator, and I find myself still learning, learning about communication in general and learning how I communicate to others, good and bad. This podcast is about changing the way that we do politics. And the first way is to challenge how we do the first way to challenge how we do politics is to challenge our own selves first. If you haven't heard the previous episodes, I really encourage you to go back and listen and then apply them to your own life. I'm pretty sure that you'll find yourself with eyes wide open and becoming more effective with talking to others who disagree with you. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. While you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. And remember, finally, remember this. If you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.